And then uh, our final speaker this afternoon is uh, Daniel Hirsch, President of the Committee to Bridge the Gap and lecturer at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Mr. Hirsch. Chairman McFarland, members of the Commission, thanks very much for the invitation to be here today. I uh, am a lecturer on nuclear policy at UC Santa Cruz and President of the Committee to Bridge the Gap, but the views here are my own today. Um, if I could have slide three. Uh, this is obviously the San Onofre reactor. When it is operating, there are billions of curies of radioactivity inside each of those domes, and outside them reside eight and a half million people within 50 miles, about four times as many as reside near Fukushima. Your job, it goes without saying, is to assure that that radioactivity remains inside those domes and that never gets out to expose those people. Next slide, please. Steam generators are an absolutely critical safety feature for assuring that that happens. They perform two vital functions. One is they are necessary for cooling the core, preventing the fuel from melting and releasing this radioactivity. Secondly, they provide a direct pathway out of containment to the environment. So they're unique. They can both cause the melt and they can provide a pathway for that radioactivity to expose people. That must never happen. Next slide, please. The steam generators at San Onofre are of the recirculating type. And so, as you've heard before, there are four basic places where you can have wear. There is a free span area in the U-tube region where the tubes can bang against each other if the thermohydraulic conditions are bad. But there are also tube support plates, anti-vibration bars, and retainer bars where they can rub against those supports. Unfortunately, we're having all four kinds of damage at San Onofre. Next slide, please. Edison makes two claims, and you've heard their entire team um, pushing for this restart of Unit 2 at 70% power. There are two fundamental claims that they make to support that. The first, next slide, is that the wear in Unit 2 is far less extensive than the wear in Unit 3 that there were 300 tubes with unexpected tube-to-tube -tube wear in Unit 3 and only two tubes with minor wear in Unit 2. Next slide, please. For months, however, Edison and NRC staff refused to release the actual data about the degree of damage within Units 2 and 3. It took Senator Boxer's intervention for these data to be revealed, and you'll see very quickly why when you look at these tables. Uh, yes, there were only two tubes showing tube-to-tube -tube wear in Unit 2 but there were thousands of indications of wear at the anti-vibration bars and the tube support plates. There are 1,600 tubes that have been damaged just in this first cycle of operation in Unit 2. And as you'll see from the next slide, there are about 1,800 tubes that have been damaged in Unit 3. And the next slide, you can just see this graphically, that there's very little difference. The number of tubes damaged between Unit 2 and Unit 3 are very similar. Unit 3 has a slightly higher fever, but both of these are very sick uh, reactors. Uh, they both need to be in intensive care. Next slide. Um, so when those data were released, Edison made a second claim that the nature of the support structure wear is not unusual in new steam generators and is part of the equipment settling in. So I asked NRC staff if they have any data about this. They said they've heard the same claim, said it was based on anecdotal information, that they had no data. So my students and I went and assembled the data that, frankly, the NRC staff should have, and the results are quite extraordinary. Next slide. You will see, and in the slides that follow, that rather than being a normal uh, amount of wear, um, it is um, very much beyond the norm, orders of magnitude beyond the norm. Next slide. You will see, for example, here that the number of indications of wear for the steam generator tubes, the median is four nationally. And for Unit 2, the one that's supposed to be better and good to go, they have over 4,700 indications of wear, a thousand times more. Next slide, the number of damaged steam generator tubes in Unit 2 Again, the good one to go, supposedly, is about 1,600. The median nationally is four. And lastly, the next slide, you'll see uh, one more slide. Yeah, that's it, sorry. Um, that there are uh, 510 tubes that have been plugged in Unit 2 when the median nationally is zero. There are more tubes plugged in one cycle of operation for this new steam generator in Unit 2 than in all new steam generators in the country combined. 
So an additional claim has now been made by Edison that's saying, yeah, we have a lot of wear in Unit 2, but this levels off over time. I asked NRC staff if they have information as to whether that's true. They said, again, they've heard it anecdotally but had no data, so I had to have my students accumulate the data once again. And to just give you one example, the Palo Verde plant, which Edison has identified as one that they claim is similar, for Units 1, 2, and 3, the number of tubes damaged don't level off. They continue to increase, and indeed the rate of increase continues to increase generally from one service inspection to the next. So there go those claims. Why does it matter? Well, for two reasons. San Onofre in just one or two years has experienced more damage than steam generators normally experience in decades. And in one to two years, they've chewed through nearly half of their 8% plugging limit. And they have thousands of indications of wear on tubes that have not been plugged, that if this wear continues, they'll have to plug as well. They can see that the wear is due to random vibration, not the fluid elastic instability causing the tube-to-tube damage. And it will continue, they concede, if they restart. So you have steam generators that cannot run for very long, even if there's no breakage, no disaster, no release. But gross failure is clearly possible. Edison, as you've heard, claims that the reason Unit 3 is in somewhat more trouble than Unit 2 is that the supports were more effective in Unit 3 than 2. But the supports are exactly what's getting worn down in Unit 2. And so that contact force is diminishing, that support is diminishing. And the problem with the tube-to-tube wear is it's sudden and unpredictable. You have a nice ramp function, perhaps, for other kinds of wear, but for the tube-to-tube, it's a step function. So if you allow them to restart Unit 2, and you get more of that support wear, loosening the fit, you are running the risk of this running out of control with the damage that's not predictable or controllable. Next slide, please. Perhaps the most extraordinary aspect of Edison's restart request is found in the following three sentences from their transmittal letter. First, next, please. They keep going, I'm sorry. Again, 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 again. Here we go. They say that the plan to run at 70% power for five months is not a fix, but an interim compensatory action. Next slide. They say after those five months, they want to shut down and see if their theory is correct. This is clearly experimenting with safety. But the critical one is the next sentence. They say, in addition, Edison has established a project team to develop a long-term plan for repairing the steam generators. So Edison knows that those steam generators need to be repaired or replaced, and is asking you to let them run without repairing or replacing them. And I would say to you, as in this next slide, that you should simply say no. It would be unwise to permit San Onofre Unit 2, with its crippled steam generators that need repair or replacement, to operate without repairing or replacing them. Now, last couple comments in the last minute or two I have. This episode has demonstrated not simply that the steam generators at San Onofre are damaged and need repair, but they've exposed some breakage in the NRC's regulatory structure itself that needs to be repaired. I am told that it took the NRC staff a total of only one day, when they finally looked at this matter, to determine that the computer code projections were wrong. One day of review, a billion dollars in expense, and a steam generator that had eight tubes that would have burst that wouldn't have been safe. One day of review that was bypassed. And Edison is now asking you to do the same thing. They want you to rely on the computer models. They're now relying on the ethos model, which also failed to predict the problem. The same people that designed the steam generators that failed, that operated them and approved them, the two other companies that have okayed this, the consultant, all telling you, yeah, maybe it wasn't done right, but trust us, we can do it again. There are eight and a half million people on the other side of those containment domes. And the only way it would be appropriate would be to make sure that that is really safe. If you had a car that had brakes that were failing, you would not get away with saying, I'll just keep it off the freeway and drive at 50 miles an hour. You'd have to get the brakes repaired. With a car, you can only kill a few people. There are hundreds of millions of curies of cesium, strontium, and iodine inside those domes that you've got to keep in. 
and letting them run would damage the generators without repairing them would be very unwise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to questions and start with Commissioner Pasloff. Thank you very much for the presentations. There were a couple of statements that confused me a little bit. Uh, Mr. Fleck, on slide...